All right. Uh, if you look at uh, verse number one there, Psalm 22, verse number one, it starts off by saying very famous words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? If you're, look, if you're reading this psalm as someone that knows, of course, of Jesus Christ and you know of the crucifixion, you know immediately just by looking at this psalm, this is a reference to Jesus Christ, okay? And, and he's suffering on the cross. The title for the sermon this morning is Jesus Forsaken of the Father. Jesus Forsaken of the Father. And uh, before I get into the sermon, I do just want to quickly thank Brother Matthew Kernow uh, just for his hard work uh, over the last few weeks uh, with, the, with the, not just the live stream, but, um, you know, the, the, the monitors. We've got that mic set up. We've got now a monitor in the or, or television there in the mother's room, all right? So any mothers that are taking the little kids, you can actually watch, still watch me live. Praise God, okay? So if you want to check that out, and actually Brother Caleb was the one that actually got that monitor up on the wall there. So uh, I don't know if anyone else has been helping out, but everybody that's been just serving this church and making sure that we get the live stream going out to the wider audience. I was going through the names just, just this week as to people who faithfully give to our church or just are faithfully listening to our church. You know, we've kind of got like a church outside of the church, you know, uh, with people that are listening in. So I'm really thankful for the online listeners as well. Though the priority, of course, is the local church and the congregation. And we'll soon see how important it is to be part of a congregation physically. Uh, but if you look at verse number one, or actually maybe some of your Bibles say there, to the chief musician upon I, I Jeleph's Shaha, I'm not sure what that means, but then it says a Psalm of David. And so even though this is about Jesus Christ, we can't also forget that David is going through anguish. Okay? David feels like at this point in time that God has forsaken him. Okay? But of course we know the truth that God will not forsake his people. But the sad reality is that God the Father did forsake the Son at a point in time. Okay? When Jesus Christ said these words, I mean that, that completely destroys modalism. Okay, where the father, you know, forsakes the son, but Jesus is the father. What did he forsake? Oh, he forsook Jesus the man, the body, not Jesus, Jesus God. Well, who died on the cross for me if he's not for God? Was it just the man? That doesn't make sense. So anyway, that's not, this sermon's not about modalism, but you know, the, the stupidity of saying that Jesus is the father. Well, how did the father then forsake Jesus Christ? Let's look at verse number one again. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring, okay? And so, of course, these are the words that Jesus Christ said when he was on the cross. You don't need to turn there. Matthew 27, 45, it says, For now, uh, sorry, now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so it is, you know, obviously, everything that Jesus Christ said on the cross is not, always, you know, completely recorded for us. Jesus said many things. We get to see uh, many of those things from the four Gospels, you know, of what Jesus Christ was saying on the cross. It's my personal belief, though I can't be dogmatic about this, it is my personal belief that all of these words are Jesus Christ. Not just verse number one, but all of these words were said of Jesus. Either, you know, either, either he said that, you know, uh, through his voice or whether that was an internal monologue within himself. I personally believe that Jesus Christ basically quoted this entire psalm as he was suffering on the cross. Because as we go verse by verse, you'll notice that every, pretty much every, I mean, every reference really is about Jesus Christ. You, you can't miss it, okay? Look at verse number two. He says, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime. And of course, Jesus Christ was crucified during the day, right? So he's crying to the Lord. But as it says here, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. So he says, look, I've also cried at night. And of course, the most you know, popular understanding of that would, of course, be Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, up all night before his arrest crying to the Lord, you know, uh, crying to his father, praying to his father, you know, uh, understanding that what he's about to struggle with. And so we see the Lord Jesus Christ in the daytime, in the nighttime, crying to the Lord God. Verse number three, he says here, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Okay. Now, what this is saying here is because the father has forsaken Jesus, Jesus is able to understand because he says, look, the Father is holy, okay? He's holy. He's separated from sin. And in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, speaking of God, it says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Look, the Bible says God cannot look at iniquity. He cannot allow sin in His presence. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, 
and holdeth thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. And so the reason the father had to forsake the son is because the son became the curse for us. He became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For ye have made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Praise God that Jesus took my sin, your sin, the sin of the whole world upon himself on the cross. But not just that, in that verse it says that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Okay? And so it's not our own personal righteousness that makes us right with God. It's the righteousness which is in Jesus Christ. We gave him our sin. We gave him the curse that should have fallen upon us, the wrath that should have fallen upon us. That was put on Jesus. He paid for it. And his righteousness, which is the righteousness of God, okay, we, we, who knew no sin, was put upon us. Praise God that I can go to heaven because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And you understand that? That the Father looks down at you and sees the righteousness of Christ upon your life. What an amazing thought, okay? No wonder, you know, once you're saved, you're always saved. Otherwise, you're saying the righteousness of Christ was not enough, you know? Once saved, always saved. And so the Father rejected the Son. And so, you know, this whole chapter is just to bring our remembrance back to the sacrifice of Christ. It's always good. It's always good for us to go back and think about what Christ has done for us, remind ourselves of His great sacrifice, and then so we can be challenged, well, if God has done this for us, Jesus Christ has sacrificed for us, what can we do in return for Him, right? Look at verse number four. It says, Our fathers trusted in Thee, they trusted and thou didst deliver them, okay? So Jesus Christ recognizes that the only place, the only hope of deliverance is through the Father, okay? And of course, don't forget this is King David. King David's going through some anguish. I don't know what it is. King David had many challenges, many wars, many enemies in his life. And he's saying, you know, he's looking back at all the forefathers that placed their trust on, on God and they were delivered through their trials, Okay, And so Jesus Christ on the cross is saying, look, there's coming a time that I'm going to be delivered from all of this. And of course, we know what happened three days later, right? Three days, three nights, he rose again from the dead. He was victorious over sin and over hell and over death and all the forces of, of wickedness that were against him. But let this be a reminder to you, brethren, that if you're going through troubles, okay, you know, trusting in the Lord is the only thing you can trust. You know, hope in His deliverance is the only thing that will get you moving forward, okay? It's not hope in anything else. This world cannot give you the hope you need, only the Lord God. He was, in the, he was the hope that Jesus Christ was relying upon, the Father, and even King David was relying upon the hope of God to deliver him, okay? Look at verse number 5. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. All right. I'll just quickly read a, a passage to you in Acts 2, 25. It says, For David speaketh concerning him, that's speaking of Jesus, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. These are the words of David, yes, but these are the words of Jesus. That, hey, he's going to rejoice, he's hopeful, he knows that his flesh shall rest in hope, because it says in verse number 27, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And so that's speaking about his soul in hell. He's also speaking about his flesh in the grave. Jesus Christ is hopeful. He knows he's going to be delivered. He knows there's coming a time when he'll be resurrected from the dead. Okay? And brethren, our resurrection... Look, I, I don't know how much we're going to suffer in this life. I don't know how difficult it's going to be. For some, it's going to be more difficult than others. Sometimes we'll see deliverance immediately. Sometimes we'll see deliverance a week from now, a year from now, 10 years from now. Who knows how long? But if not, your deliverance will be at your resurrection. At that point, when you have those new bodies, all right, that can never sin, that's it, brethren. You're never going to... Uh, shed a tear ever again. Your, your tears will be wiped from your faces after the resurrection, after the rapture, okay? That is our ultimate deliverance from this world. Our, ultimately, our ultimate deliverance from, from sin and from the, the, the troubles and turmoils that this world gives us. Look at verse number six. Jesus saying here, but I, but I am a worm, okay, and no man. So Jesus has lowered himself so low, right? He just refers to himself like a little worm a reproach of men, and despised of the people, okay? So this should immediately bring to your remembrance the fact that when Christ was on the cross, 
he was being mocked by all the people, right? By the chief priests, by the, by the Jews of those days. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 53 verse 3, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. You know what the Bible's saying there? And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. You know, even the believers were ashamed. Even Peter denied Christ, right? Even his disciples fled away when, when Christ was arrested and, and crucified. You know, you would have done the same. You would have loved Jesus Christ during those three years of ministry, but when he was arrested, when he was brought before the, 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 you know, the authorities, when he was crucified, you would have hid your face as well. Okay, Jesus Christ was despised by all. He was rejected by all. He became that sin, not just rejected by God the Father, but by all men. All right, verse number seven. And they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip and shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. What does that sound like to you? Oh, I'll just read the passage. Matthew 27, verse 41. It says, Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders, saying, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. And so as we're going through this chapter, don't you notice the psalm, the psalm right? Don't you notice that every verse is just referring to Christ? The fact that he's being laughed to scorn, the fact that he has his his trust in God. And you know what, brethren? Yes, you know, I just told you the only one we can trust and the only one we can have deliverance is, is in God. But when you put your trust and deliverance in God, people will mock you. They'll be laughing, hey, when's God going to save that person? When is God going to come through for them? And you know as much as I know how many times God has seen us through. Not only has He given us salvation, how many times has He answered our prayers? How many times has He given us, you know, the resources that to, in order for us to live in this life? He's given us our every need, right? God has come through. God comes through today. The fact that we can be in church, you know, gathered together. God has come through and planted this church here on the Sunshine Coast. God is continuously delivering us and giving us the requests that we, we have from Him, okay? And so the world will mock you. And, and of course, the world mocked Christ. You know, he did save others. And they're saying, how can he save himself? Verse number nine. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. I, I, I love these verses because what King David and, is saying here is that basically from his very birth, you know, God has, the God of the Bible has always been his God right? His, his mother was saved. His father, you know, was saved. And as soon as he was born, all right, as soon as he was on his mother's breast, he was hearing about God, all right? He, he was one of, you know, he, he, from his very birth, he was uh, one of God's, well, he wasn't saved, but of course he was, you know, hearing about the Lord God. And my, my, my joy in that is just knowing that, you know, you may not have yourself grown up in a Christian family, but your children have the opportunity, you know, to, as, at a very young age, from in a very early age, maybe even straight from the womb, to know the God of the Bible, okay? And so he's, David's just reminding the Lord God, hey, you've been my God since the very beginning. You know, even, even though I need you now in this time of anguish, you've been my God from the very beginning. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 30, it says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. You know what? Yes, Jesus is our God from all eternity past, but even he, in the womb of his mother, when he came into this world, right? From the very beginning, the Father was his God, right? You know, Jesus Christ, you know, has a God. You know, we need to understand the Trinity. There is one God, and yet God the Father is the God of Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians eleven thirty one, it says, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. Okay? And so even Jesus Christ has a God. He had a God from His very birth, referring to the Father there. Okay? And it's that same Father that we saw in verse number 1 that had to forsake Him, had to reject Him for becoming the sin curse for us. Look at verse number 11. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. So just a reminder there, 
that the only one to help in trouble is God. The only one we should be going to is the Lord God. Verse number 12. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a, and a roaring lion. Now, I thought this was quite interesting because, you know, w- w- Jesus is describing the people that put him into this position as these animals, the, these bulls. And I assume, you know, the bulls are strong. You know, you, you might be a, a afraid that the bull will charge you down if you face one in the field. I had that experience once. I remember, you know, I was in, uh, my, a lot of my family in Chile have farms and they've got, you know, all kinds of horses and cows and bulls and they've got these big fields. So sometimes you, you might jump the fence and get into the field and you don't really see the animal for, for a while. And then all of a sudden, you know, from the distance, I'm looking at this huge bull, right? And I'm like, oh no, do I move? What? You know, it's just like staring at it. It's just like, it's just like I'm like, oh man. <laughs> I remember just, I, I, just, I just sprinted. I just found the nearest fence. That bull came charging. Okay? Just found the nearest fence, jumped over the fence. And of course, I mean, I, I, was, I was far from the bull, but you know, it still gave me a lot of fright. You know? And so you know, Jesus Christ is describing the people that put him on the cross like these bulls you know, that want to tear him down. But not just a bull, but these ro- ravening and roaring lion. And so I did a quick search, because you know, obviously we, we know the passage of, of the devil you know, walking about as a, as a roaring lion. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walk about seeking whom he may devour. And so what I started to notice, I didn't, I didn't really notice, know this until I started to look into it. I was just curious, like, where else in the Bible does it speak about a roaring lion, okay? And so, of course, you know, the devil wants nothing more but to destroy Jesus Christ. I mean, the devil didn't understand the fact that this was the the mission of Christ, that he came to die for us, okay? You know, the devil tried to kill Jesus when he was just a little child. Remember that? When when children under the age of two were killed throughout Jerusalem. I mean, throughout, uh, was it Jerusalem? Bethlehem, Bethlehem, sorry, yeah, Bethlehem. But I was just looking at some other passages, and if you can keep your finger there, go to Proverbs 28. Go to Proverbs 28, verse 15. Proverbs 28, Verse 15, the Bible reads, As a roaring lion and a raging bear, so is a wicked ruler over the poor people. Amen. So I was thinking about, okay, a wicked ruler is like a roaring lion. And then I was thinking about, yeah, that's, that's Jesus Christ was before, brought before the rulers. He was brought before Pilate and Herod. And, you know, he was brought before the governors. And, yeah, they were the roaring lion as well. They, they put him. They, they, they were the ones that, that made the decision to crucify Christ. I'll just read another passage to you in Ezekiel 22, verse 25. This is the other reference of a roaring lion. It says, There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof. Like a roaring lion ravening the prey, they have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. And so it says here that there's a conspiracy amongst the prophets. And of course, the prophets are the religious leaders, right? They're the ones that are preaching, supposed to be preaching and teaching the word of God. And yeah, they also betrayed Jesus. It was the chief rulers. It was the Pharisees. It was these wicked religious leaders in that day that arrested Christ and brought him before the authorities. And I'm just saying, wow, every time it's talking about the roaring lion and then the devil, of course, you know, these are all involved in getting Jesus to the cross ultimately, right? In a very physical sense. So I was, thought, I was quite, quite amazed at just how consistent the Bible is with all these, you know, uh, passages here of the roaring lion. Back to Psalm 22, verse 14. Psalm 22, verse 14. The Bible reads here, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. And so... I just think about what does it mean to be poured out like water. I just found a reference in Lamentations. I'll just read it to you. Lamentations 2.19. Of course, this is about uh, the, you know, the, the southern kingdom of Judah being taken into captivity by the Babylonians. What does lamentation mean? It means to cry out. It means to weep. It means to be full of sorrow. And so the prophet Jeremiah, you know, seeing the, the nation of Judah being taken into captivity, was filled with lamentations, was filled with sorrow. And he, and he says in uh, Lamentations 2.19, Arise, cry out in the night, in the beginning of the watches, pour out thine heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift up thy hands toward him for the life of thy young children, 
that faints for hunger in the top of every street. And so the pouring out of your heart like water, I believe, is probably how we can understand verse number 14 there, is the fact that Jesus Christ, once again, is calling out to God, calling out for help, right? Because the, the southern kingdom here was being taken captive. Uh, you know, the, 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 the city of Jerusalem was under siege by the Babylonians. And so that's what I believe is being ha- what's happened there, that Christ is pouring out like water. The other thought might be excessive sweating. We know that when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweat great drops, like, like dr- great drops of blood. And so it might be that he was just a very uh, taxing thing on his body, so he's full of sweat. That's another understanding there. But then it says in verse number 14, and all my bones are out of joints. If your bone is out of joints, that's a dislocation, right? It's a dislocated bone. And that's very painful. I don't know if you've had a uh, dislocated bone. It's very painful. It says here that all of his bones are out of joints. Okay? So when you look at, you know, the, the Jesus movies where he's being crucified, and, uh, you know, so there are some bloody depictions of that, but I've never really seen one where the guy's body is just completely dislocated. I don't know about you, but that's what it's telling us, right? That Jesus' body was completely out of joint from all the beatings, the whippings from the crucifixion. I mean, I, I don't know exactly how much he suffered physically, but he was beaten to the point where his bones are dislocated you know, in his body, right? And so, just, just the, the pain and suffering that Jesus Christ went for, for us. Look at verse number 15. My strength is dried up like a pot shed. So, he's lost his strength. And my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. So, of course, Jesus Christ is about to die, but he says his tongue cleaveth to his jaws, of course, speaking about the, the thirst, okay? So not just the physical suffering on the outside, but the thirst in his mouth. John chapter 19, verse 28 says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. And so Jesus Christ, have you ever been so thirsty where you just want that drop of water? You know, Jesus Christ going through dehydration, you know, so thirsty as well. That what he suffered, verse number 16. For dogs have come past me, so he's speaking again, again about the people around him as animals, as do- the dogs have come past me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. What an amazing verse. Because crucifixion, in the time of David when he wrote this psalm, it wasn't a form of death penalty. It didn't exist as far as I understand when looking at the history books. Crucifixion did not exist during the time of David. It was not a way that the, the, the people of this land would put someone to death, Right? And yet, somehow, through the, through the work of the Holy Spirit, and this is why we know the Bible is an amazing book, inspired by God, written by God. God is the author. Men moved by the Holy Ghost. It's because He can write about such, you know, clarity of, of the sacrifice of Christ. It's so amazing you know, how the Bible just comes together like this, right? And so, of course, the piercing of the hands and the feet is, is the crucifixion. You know, as, as I was preparing this sermon, I was just going through this, I'm just like, you know, these, you know, Jesus Christ describing these people as bulls and lions and dogs. You know, I'm just finding myself getting angry at these people. They, you know, and of course, you know, I understand that Jesus had to die anyway. But just the hatred they had for him. Just, just the blasphemy. You know, just laughing at him being the king and the son of God. You know, just got me so angry thinking about these people. And then I just remember what Jesus Christ said on the cross in Luke 23, 34. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Can you understand that? I can't, I can't understand that. You know, Jesus Christ, full of mercy, full of compassion. Remember, He didn't come to destroy, not the first time anyway. You know, He came to save, right? And so even Jesus Christ was able to just ask God, can you forgive them? I mean, if my son is being tortured, you know, by a group of wicked people, can I really, I, look, can you, can you forgive them? I, you know, just be honest, I can't. <laughs> I can't forgive them. I mean, you know, they haven't even apologized for it. And Jesus is just stepping in, preempting, and just saying, Lord, can you forgive them? Father, forgive them. You know, and of course, many of these are reprobate. Many of these, you know, uh, died in their sin and went to hell. And yet, how many, you know, by the words of Christ here, you know, probably, and we know one of the Roman centurions acknowledged that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. I mean, there were probably many that just by watching Christ, just like Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness, and people looked upon it and, and were delivered from the, from, the, from, the, from the venom of the snakes. You know, how many people at that point in time was looking at Jesus Christ? 
and actually got saved at that point and realized, wow, this is an innocent man. He's dying for me. You know, how many were driven to understand this sacrifice? Who is this man? And eventually got saved. So, you know, that's what I, I, ultimately, that's what I believe Jesus Christ is speaking about. Those that were responsible to some extent of putting him on there. Because remember, it was the multitude saying, crucify him, crucify him. Okay. So there must have been some in that midst that actually ended up, you know, getting saved. Look at verse number 17. He says, I may, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. So this is the same idea of the dislocation. When it says here that I can tell all my bones, it's the idea, you know, to tell is to give account, right? You're telling something, you're giving it an account of something. When you go to the bank, you're dealing with a bank teller, okay? So they're responsible for accounting of money, right? Counting. And so the idea there, I tell all my bones, is that while his body's all dislocated and out of joint, Jesus can look at his body and he can count his bones. He can see his bones sticking out, okay? Now, you know, the prophecy is that Jesus, none, none of his bones were broken, okay? But they were definitely dislocated. They were definitely, you were able to see it. You were able to see those bones and count them on his body. And so, and it says, they look and stare upon me. You know, in Isaiah 52 verse 14, it says, And many were astonished at thee. His visage was so marred, more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Okay, so Christ on the cross, his visage was so marred, more than any man. Okay, I mean, he didn't even look like a man. He was so disfigured when he was on the cross. So bloody, so beaten. Okay, and, and he sacrificed for us. You know, the physical suffering, we're focusing on him more than the spiritual suffering at this point in time. But just the physical suffering was so great upon the Lord. Look at verse number 18. How can we deny this is not about Jesus? It's impossible. Look at verse 18. And uh, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Of course, in John 19, verse 23, it says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam woven from the top throughout, they said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. And so there's no denying that this psalm is about Jesus Christ, that his clothes were taken. And remember that clothes in those days, very expensive. They didn't have machines like we do today, where it's just, it just takes a few cents to manufacture. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of work to put clothes together, good quality clothes. And so instead of it being destroyed and thrown out, the soldiers divided it amongst themselves by casting lots. Verse number 19. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. So once again, we see that King David and Jesus Christ, by extension, asking the Lord God for help. And again, these wicked people described as animals, right? The power of the dog, the lion's mouth, you know. This is the time when Jesus Christ was at his weakest, the lowest points in his life. But the, the, past, the part that I wanted to look at here in verse number 21, just right at the end, because people mock the Bible. They say, see, the Bible talks about unicorns, right? This mythical, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe it was real. Who knows? I don't know. You know how many animals have been extinct? How many animals we don't even know about, right? I mean, there could have been a horse with a horn. I don't know, with a single horn. Why is that so impossible to believe, right? I mean, I don't find that impossible to believe. But of course, people, you know, mock the Bible. And it says, for thou hast heard me, from the horns of the unicorns. So what is, what is a unicorn? Just very quickly, okay? So, you know, it's not some mythical beast. It's obviously a true animal. The unicorn is mentioned a number of times in the Bible. And, you know, even today, even, even amongst the animals that we do have on this earth, we do have an animal that we call a unicorn today, okay? And it's the Indian rhinoceros. Most, you know, the, the most common rhinoceros has two horns. But the Indian rhinoceros only has one horn, okay, the Indian rhinoceros. And the scientific name for it is rhinoceros unicornis, okay? It's a unicorn. Why? What does it mean? What does unicorn mean? Well, uni, all right, like you know, uno. Have you ever played uno? You know, uno in Spanish is one, single, okay? And, and corn is just is a, a ref, you know, reference to the horn, all right? So unicorn is an animal with a single horn. That's all it is. 
okay? And the Indian rhinoceros has a single horn. Hey, that's a unicorn. I don't necessarily believe, I don't believe actually that was the animal that's been referred to here, okay? Um, and I don't know, I don't know if you ever looked up rhinoceroses and, and some of the, uh, the ones that walked around during the Ice Age, you know, with the woolly mammoth. There's like this woolly uh, rhinoceros and there's the, uh, there's the extinct giant rhinoceros, which the scientific name is the Elasmotherium. Uh, look it up yourself. In, it, you can Google ex, the, the giant rhinoceros. It's extinct now. And it's got a single horn as well, but it's massive. It's huge. It's like, it's, 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 it, I can't even describe how huge it is. It's, it's, it's massive, okay, compared to the average horn that you would see on a rhinoceros, you know, today. And of course, you know, the, 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 the name of the rhinoceros, why does it have that name? You know, because rhino means nose. You know, it's, I don't know, I'm, I don't recommend this at all, but, you know, people that get themselves a nose job, you know, the, the practice is called uh, rhin, rhinoplas, rhinoplasty, plasty, yeah? So that's referring to the nose, the rhino bit of it, right? And then, of course, the, the, the rhinoceros, the ceros is, again, a reference. It, it might be Latin or French for horn, okay? And, you know, that's not the only animal that we have on this earth that has a single horn. You guys might be familiar with that whale, which is called the, or little, like a dolphin-like creature, which is the narwhal, okay? And it's got this sort of canine tooth that, you know, protrudes. Looks like this, this horn, this single horn that sticks out. And the scientific name for the narwhal is the monodon, Monoceros, monoceros. So mono, mono means one, and seros, like rhinoceros, rhinoceros, is one, is a horn. Okay, so even that animal is described as a is a unicorn, and it's got one horn, right? So we have another animal in the deep like that. I personally believe that the unicorn re referenced in here is probably an extinct animal that we don't know about because if you if you research it, we don't have time for it today. It's an animal that could not be tamed. You know, even rhinoceroses are being tamed in, in like circuses and stuff like that to stand on, a, you know, on one foot or whatever they do with those animals. So, but it's an animal that could not be tamed by man, okay? So maybe like, maybe a, maybe a dinosaur, maybe some type of dinosaur that, you know, plenty of dinosaurs had a single horn. Um, if you look them up, I don't, I don't know how real all these animals are necessarily, but, you know, it could, could be any kind of creature with a single horn. But if you look at, this, look at the end of verse number 21 very quickly, it says, and thou heard me from the horns of the, rhin uh, of the unicorns, sorry, of the unicorns. And so you can see that there's not just one horn here, there are several horns mentioned, okay? But also, so it's in plural, but also notice that the unicorn is also, also plural, okay? So the reason why there's several horns is because it's speaking of several unicorns, okay? But each unicorn had a single horn. Just another reference, keep your finger there, go to Psalm 92. Go to Psalm 92 for me. Psalm 92 verse number 10, Psalm 92, and verse number 10, it reads, But my horn, so that's a singular horn, shalt thou exalt like the horn, singular horn, of a unicorn. So the singular unicorn there. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Okay, so the unicorn's mentioned a few times in the Bible, and even when Israel was delivered out of, the Egypt, out of Egypt, right, in, in Numbers 23, verse 22, it says, God, God brought them out of Egypt, he, ha he hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn, okay? So the unicorn is an animal of great strength. And it's saying that, you know, God is like this unicorn that delivered them out of Egypt, okay? And so if we go back to Psalm 22, verse 21, and it says, For thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. You know, that's a few things there to think about. The fact that the unicorn is a, you know, a very strong creature. You know, it's referring here that, you know, even though the Father did not, delivered Jesus from the cross because he had to die, you know, nevertheless, God has all power. You know, God has strength. God is horned. He has multiple horns of the unicorns that he is within, right, uh, amongst. You know, this could be a reference to the armies of, of heaven, the angels that could easily have delivered Jesus from the hands of the wicked. And so, you know, even though, you know, you may think of God today, you're going through some difficulty, you're going through some trial, you know, your thought might be, well, why isn't God helping me? Why isn't God delivering me right now? Look, don't let that discourage you because God has the strength of a unicorn. He can deliver you in the same way. He can exalt you like the horn of a unicorn, okay? He can lift you high. And so Jesus Christ and, of course, David, just thinking about the strength that God has and ultimately God will deliver them through their trials, through their difficulties. Look at verse number... 22 now and so we now we shift away from the crucifixion of christ okay 
And, you know, it, like I said, it's good for us to meditate from time to time what Christ has done for us, all right? Look at verse number 22. And when we do that, when we understand what Christ has done for us, okay, this should be our response in verse number 22. It says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. So that's our response, brethren. Jesus has suffered for us. You know, he, he died for us. You know, we look at the sufferings on the cross here, and it, it, it gets me angry sometimes. It gets me upset to think about what Christ had to go through. So what should I do? I should go in the midst of the congregation and sing praises to God. I should declare His name to the brethren. And where am I going to find the brethren? In the congregation. Okay? That should be our response. And of course, this verse, you know, just uh, is repeated for us in the book of Hebrews. And I'll just read it to you. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. It says, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. You know what? Jesus is not ashamed to call you brethren. His brethren. Okay? And of course, when you look at verse number 22, it says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. You know, when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he came to declare the Father, okay? And the authority that the Father has over all things. And you know what we should be doing? Declaring the name of Christ. Declaring the name of the Father. Declaring the God who's given us salvation. All right? In the midst of, and then in verse number 12, Hebrews 2 verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. Will I sing praise unto thee in the midst of the church? You know what? When you think about what Christ has done, our response should be, I want to be in church. I want to be amongst the brethren. I want to sing praises to God for what he's given me, for his sacrifice. That's the proper response. Church. Okay? Remember, this is Jesus. He's saying, look, I'm not ashamed of calling you my brethren. You know what? I'm not ashamed of you being my brother or sister in the Lord. I'm not ashamed because you've been saved. You know, you're a sinner just like me. All right, you know, we've all done wicked things. We all deserve hell, but God has delivered us. I don't, I'm not ashamed to call you brethren because I know what Jesus has done for you, okay? And if I'm willing to accept what he's done for me, I have to be willing to accept what he's done for you as well, okay? And so don't forget this is uh, David also saying these words, right? He's going through anguish and he's going through difficulties, but he says, you know what? I'm going to be in church anyway. You know, even, even in the midst of my difficulties and trials, hey, that's where you need to be the most, you know, there are some people that will avoid church when they're going through difficulties, when they're upset, when they're frustrated, when, when they're suffering. It's like, I can't go to church. But church is where you need to be. Church amongst the brethren. Church where, where the Lord can meet you. We can hear the preaching of His Word. That's where you need to be. And so, you know, I'm thankful for the online work that Brother Matt's been doing, as I mentioned. I'm thankful for that. But, you know, the online listeners, don't let the, the preach, don't let this become church for you. You need to be amongst the brethren. You need to find the best church you can find. Make that a priority in your life, you know, to be amongst the brethren so you can be in the midst of the congregation to praise the Lord God. Church is where we need to be when you're suffering the most, okay? Verse number 23, Psalm 22, verse 23. Ye that fear the Lord, praise Him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify Him and fear Him. All ye the seed of Israel, Okay? And of course, you know, when David's saying this, he's talking about his nation. Hey, all of us, that the seed of Abraham, we ought to be praising God. We ought to have a fear of God. But don't forget Galatians 3.29. It says, And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Listen, we are also the seed of Israel, because we're in Christ. Okay? We're the spiritual seed. And so this is about us. We ought to praise Him. We ought to fear Him. We ought to glorify God for what He's done for us. Verse number 24. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither have he hid his face from him when he cried unto him, he heard. Now, brethren, we started by, by acknowledging that the Father forsook the Son. Okay? But why did he forsake the Son? So you would never be forsaken. That's why. You know, if, we're never going to suffer like Jesus did. No matter how much you suffer, God will always be there for you, okay? But in Jesus' case, he lost the fellowship of the Father. The Father had to forsake him. So you would never be forsaken when you believe on Jesus Christ. You know, Hebrews 13, 5 says, For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Do you believe that, brethren? You will never be left by God, never forsaken by God. 
You know, this is why we can cry to Him. He can hear, He can listen. He will deliver us through our trials. Verse number 25. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I think we have a great congregation. I think we have a great church. I will pay my vows before them that fear Him. All right? So, once again, church is the place we need to be to praise God, to think about what He's done. There's a reason why the church is called the body of Christ. Because we remember the body of Christ that suffered for us. No, and now it's our job to continue the work that Christ has left us to do. Okay? When we come to church, we are honoring His body. We are honoring His sacrifice for us. All right? Look at verse number 26. Things take another, another shift in focus now. So what we pick up from verse number 26 to the end of the chapter is the millennial kingdom to come. Okay? So the, the, the Psalm 22 started with Christ's lowest place that He's ever been. Okay? The worst place He's ever been. The lowest state He's ever been. But He ends with Him being exalted. He ends with His highest place on this earth anyway. Okay? I, know, I know He's got all authority and power in heaven, but at least on this earth, it ends with His millennial kingdom, which is the, the highest place of exaltation that He's going to receive on this earth. Look at verse number 26. It says, The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek Him. Your heart shall... Your heart shall live forever. Look, the meek shall eat and be satisfied. Okay? Now, I couldn't help but think of Matthew 5.5, 5, the words of Jesus when He says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Okay? So this is the exciting future that we have. Okay? That we're, we are the meek. We were meek enough to acknowledge that we needed Jesus to save us. That our works cannot save us. You know, those that think their works will save them, they're not being meek. That's pride. To think you're good enough for heaven, what a show off. Okay? That's pride. But it says, look, we shall eat and be satisfied. You know, it's coming a time when we're going to inherit the earth. We're going to be in charge of this whole earth, brethren. You say, I don't want to be in charge of it right now. Yeah, I agree. I don't want to be in charge of it right now. But Jesus Christ will come back and he's going to have a new kingdom, a new earth. Of course, you know, this, you know Christ coming back for a thousand years. And we're going to rule and reign for, with him. But look at verse number 27. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. Look at the next part. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. Wow. That's not now, brethren. Not all kindreds of the nations are worshiping Jesus now. In fact, most of this world hates Jesus. Okay? Hate the Bible. There's coming a time when the entire world will worship Jesus. Okay? And... Uh, like I said, that it ends with the most exalted position he has on this earth. Look at verse number 28. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. Praise God. You know, normally if you're a governor, you're the governor of one nation. Or well, Jesus is going to be the governor of all nations. Okay, he's going to be in charge of it all. In Isaiah 9, 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And so the government, the, the whole government of the earth, we put upon the shoulders of Jesus Christ. Okay? In Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And so an exciting future to come, brethren, when we don't have to deal with these corrupt politicians and this, this wicked government, we're going to have a government upon the shoulders of Jesus Christ. And you're going to be part of that government system. Okay? You're going to be part of it. Look at verse number uh, 29. Well, actually, it's verse, well, let's read 29 first. And they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. Okay? So the people during this millennium kingdom, those that are the most well off on the earth, okay, they're going to worship Jesus. They're going to eat, they're going to have, right? They got fat upon the earth, they will eat and worship. And then it says, All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him. So those of a lower estate in the millennial kingdom, they will also bow before Jesus. Doesn't matter your, your class on the earth during that thousand years. No matter what you have on the earth, okay, you're going to be bowing down, worshiping Jesus, and none can keep alive his own soul. All right. Look at verse number 30, though. Now, of course, we're going to be worshiping Jesus, okay? But then in verse number 30, it speaks of the seed again which I said is us, you know, all the believers, the seed. It says here in verse number 30, 
a seed shall serve him, it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. So it's differentiating here in verse number 27, 28, 29, that the whole earth will worship him and we will worship him, okay? But then there's a seed that will not just worship him, but will serve him, okay? And that's what we're going to be doing in the millennium. We're going to be part of that government system. We're going to be ruling and reigning with Jesus. We're going to be serving him, okay? We're going to be in charge of what, what I hope I'm in charge of the Sunshine Coast. I don't know. Maybe we, we'll arm wrestle about that. In, in the new resurrected bodies, though, not because <laughs> Callum will win. I, I don't want him to win it. In the new resurrected bodies, we'll arm wrestle. I reckon I'll get the Sunshine Coast. You guys can have Sydney, all right? But we're going to serve him, you know? There's, there's a specific seed being mentioned here. And in 2 Timothy 2.11, it says, For it is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Okay? We're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ during that millennial kingdom. And look at verse number 31. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness. And I believe the day here is the seed that was just mentioned in verse 30. They shall come and declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. Okay? So during the millennial kingdom, hey, there'll still be people being born. And guess what our job is during the millennial kingdom? Soul winning. <laughs> Doesn't change. All right? We're still to go there, people that are born into the earth, and tell them about Jesus, to declare the righteousness of Jesus so they can also put their faith and trust on Jesus and be a worshiper of his. And so, brethren, you know what? The soul winning continues in the millennium. All right, and let this be a challenge to us in verse number 31. Hey, it's still our job today. It's our job today to declare His righteousness, to declare what Christ has done for us on the cross, okay? His crucifixion, the fact that He suffered for us, but also the exciting future of a heaven, the new heaven, the new earth to come, the fact that He's going to have the millennium upon this earth. These are all exciting things. There's a future to be excited about, you know? And that's what's going to drive you out soul winning, you know, remembering what Christ has done for us and being excited for the future to come. Okay, let's pray.